Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube. So this is going to be part one of our 1500 subscriber Q&A. Back on April 6, 2020 of this year when this channel surpassed 1500 subscribers, I did upload a video soliciting questions for an upcoming view of Q&A series. This is part one in that series. There's going to be roughly three or four parts to this particular series, guys, because I got asked a lot of questions. And there's other people coming at me saying, hey, you didn't answer any personal questions that we asked about you in the other Q&A series you did when this channel surpassed 1,000 subscribers. So now I got to do all those questions as well. So please bear with me. We're going to get right to it. One quick thing, I do apologize about the camera angle. I am actually charging my camera while I'm shooting this particular video. So please forgive me. I know that is an annoying camera angle. I did the best I could. Here we go. First question. Sean, is collecting things you like better than collecting things that are more likely to have value in the future? It depends what your goals are. If you just have a passion for collecting things, you're not going into debt, you're not hurting yourself or your family's finances, you just want to buy things that you enjoy, things that you want to own, you don't care about the financial aspects of it or even the, the financial consequences of your actions, by all means, you do you. I've said this before. There's a big difference between somebody who makes $120,000 a year and wants to buy a $2,000 Funko Pop because he just wants to own it and he doesn't care if the item goes to zero in 10 years. Between that and somebody who makes $30,000 a year, goes out and buys that same $2,000 Funko Pop and then comes on my comment section of my videos and states that $2,000 Funko Pop is going to go to $4,000 in 5 or 10 years when there's no market fundamentals to even dictate that. That's the difference. I care about the people who are getting involved in the speculation and the investment of these items who really don't know the full scope of their actions, the market as a whole, and what they're doing. So again, if you like to watch my channel just because you like the content, you like the interaction that I provide with my audience, and really you have no goal in sight to build wealth in antiques and collectibles or other asset classes, by all means, do you. You're not hurting anyone. But on the same token, this channel was created from the mindset of somebody who is versed both in the antiques and collectibles trade, who also has knowledge of economics and finance, and really wanted to find a way to communicate this knowledge to the masses. That's where I come in to play. So whatever reason you have for being here, if you just enjoy a lot of these collecting categories, by all means, do you. But if you do want to invest in these collecting categories for the long term, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And sadly, as I peruse YouTube and other content creators, there's a lot of hype out there and there's a lot of people that are going to get burned very badly over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And that's why I am the contrarian in the YouTube community when it comes to antiques and collectibles. That's why I released this channel. Next question. Why do you say that there is a comparison to Beanie Babies and Pop Vinyl Dolls? I'm not going to read what else you wrote because I think that is the crux of your question and I want to answer this very carefully. Beanie Babies are comparable to what's happening in the Funko Pop marketplace. Both products were created with mass-produced artificial scarcity in mind. Neither product has legitimate organic collectability. And if those terms confuse you, I have done a whole series of videos talking about mass-produced scarcity versus organic collectability. Let me just give you the mainstay example that I always go to. There's a lot of video game collectors out there that want to get a copy of Stadium Events. Now, ironically, when Stadium Events came out, it wasn't even that good of a game. In fact, World Class Track Meet, in my opinion, is probably the better version. The reason that people are going after Stadium Events is because it got pulled from the market early due to the licensing conflict between Nintendo and Bandai for World Class Track Meet. Now, ironically, the people that are buying Stadium Events today, they're paying a premium to get it on the secondary market because it is a valuable Nintendo game. Well, back when it came out, nobody ever thought it would be valuable. You used to be able to get the game at Funko Land if you could find it for less than five bucks sitting on the shelf. And if you bought it, they would laugh at you and they would say, nobody wants that game. You want to give me five bucks for that? Here, take the game. Nobody cared. That's how I got most of my copies of stadium events that were all sold at a later date for a tremendous profit. That's an example of organic collectability. A Funko Pop, a Beanie Baby, a rare Mythic Magic card, a Nintendo Amiibo, all those items were produced with 
mass-produced scarcity in mind. Very few items that are produced from the standpoint of mass-produced scarcity ever become valuable organic collectibles in the antiques and collectibles trade. You must understand that. Another example, Black Lotus. Every Magic the Gathering collector I know wants to own a Black Lotus, whether they get the Alpha version, the Beta version, or the Unlimited version. The Black Lotus is an iconic Magic the Gathering card. Well, back when they released Magic the Gathering and nobody knew what the hell the game was, the people were coming in, playtesting the game, they would give the people a pack of Alpha cards. Some of those people got some rare cards in those packs that would be very valuable today. Well, nobody knew that Magic the Gathering would become valuable. So most of the people, when they were done test playing the game, they just left the cards and walked away. The reason why a Black Lotus or other alpha version Magic the Gathering cards are rare today is because back when they were released, nobody coveted them. They didn't have mass-produced scarcity. They truly are organic collectibles. That's why people are paying $150,000 for a BGS 9.5 quad Black Lotus. It's organic collectability versus mass-produced scarcity. Now, one more comment on your question before I go to the next. The Beanie Baby Marketplace isn't as dead as you think. One to three percent of all Beanie Babies that were produced in the 1990s and the early 2000s are still selling for a premium on the secondary market. It's just the market fizzled out because it was based on mass-produced scarcity. The same thing is going to happen with vinyl Funko Pop dolls. Whether it happens over the next year, next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years, eventually that market's going to die out. And a lot of the people that are holding those particular items that cost $500,000, $2,000, $3,000 are going to lose a substantial amount of money. Enough said. Why do you talk about the value of any given item will be hundreds of years from now? Let me reword that because it's worded a little bit weird. Why do you talk about what the value of any given item will be hundreds of years from now? So what this person is asking is, in some of my videos, I talk about the stability of certain collecting markets. And when I talk about coins, currency, firearms, art, historical documents, collectible first edition books, traditional antiques, some of those items I mention where if you are going to collect them for decades or hundreds of years from now, those items would still most likely have a market in the future. Those markets are very established markets in the antiques and collectibles trade. Well, this person's asking why I would even bring that up because as he states, what relevance does that have to collecting today? I have no plans on being here 500 years from now. I understand that, neither do I. But most people are attempting to build wealth, whether we're talking about stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, real estate, gold, silver, oil, cryptocurrency, pick your poison. Part of building wealth is diversifying assets. If you're going to diversify assets long term and you're looking at it from my standpoint, I want to go in collecting categories where I don't have to babysit those markets. Markets like coins, currency, antique firearms, art, some of the other collecting categories that I already mentioned, those particular markets are stable where if I hand them down to my nephew, my niece, if I ever have kids, if I would ever have grandkids, those particular people, those markets should still be going strong even 50, 100 years from now. So I'm looking at it from the standpoint where I'm trying to build long-term wealth. That's why it matters to me. Chances are, if you have a comic book collection, if you have a video game collection, if you have any of these other esoteric or speculative markets you're building a collection for, and you die tomorrow and your kids get that collection, chances are, I hate to say it guys, they're going to end up selling that collection. Now, I would expect my nieces and nephews to sell my coin and currency collection at some point. But if they don't, the potential is there for that item to still be stable and valuable 10, 20, 50, 100 years out, in my opinion, the way that I analyze the market. That's why that's important. Next question. Do you think the Wii U will ever be collectible? As most of the Wii U back catalog of games moves on to the Nintendo Switch, there are still a few gems. Will people look at the Wii U in years to come as a collectible console or a flop? This is a great question, but one thing that you have to understand is there's a lot of people that are incorrectly thinking that vintage video games equate to modern era games. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a lot of people that think that since video games from the 1980s, 1990s, and even the early 2000s are collectible, 
the market going forward is going to always be collectible, where people are going to go after Wii games, Wii U games, Nintendo Switch games, Nintendo 3DS games. I don't see it that way at all. If you look at what's happening with the market for collectible video games right now, Nintendo, Capcom, even Sony and Microsoft, a lot of these companies, they're realizing that there's a lot of gold and missed opportunities in their back catalog of games. So what's happening? You have a company like Nintendo that releases Xenoblades for the original Nintendo Wii, then says, wait a minute, we need to make a 3DS port of this game. Then the 3DS port comes out. Now they release the Nintendo Switch. Wait a minute, we need to make another port of Xenoblade Chronicles for the Nintendo Switch. So now we have Xenoblade Chronicles, the definite collection or the definite edition that's coming out in May of this year, 2020. So what's happening is the market's changing. So I understand what you're saying. There are certain games on the Nintendo Wii U that have not been given the Switch treatment, mainly Super Mario 3D World, Paper Mario Color Splash, uh, Pikmin 3, and Xenoblade Chronicles X. Those games, I think some of them will premiere on the Nintendo Switch. I think they will not do a port of Xenoblade Chronicles X, which to me, that's one of the best games for the Wii U. So I think that's your opportunity in Wii U collecting, a game like that. But overall, the system is not going to be as coveted as previous Nintendo systems or even as coveted as the Nintendo Switch. Because again, you answered your own question. All the games are being ported to the Nintendo Switch. The Wii U is a notable Nintendo failure. Um, we can compare it right there with the Virtual Boy. But again, I would not be investing in the Virtual Boy either because if you look at the price trajectory of Virtual Boy and the games, they're starting to sell at a discount now when before they were selling at a premium, meaning prices have come down on a lot of that stuff because the generation that grew up with the Virtual Boy that came out in 1995, that was the year that I graduated high school, that generation is already pretty much in their late 30s, early 40s, and the like. So you got to be careful when you analyze that market. Um, just know I don't think the Wii U is going to be the next big collectible that a lot of people are predicting, just simply because Nintendo keeps releasing a lot of their games on other consoles. And I really think going forward, Nintendo is going to do this regularly where like Super Mario Odyssey on the Nintendo Switch, that'll probably premiere at some point on the next Nintendo console, whether it's in download only form or whether it's in physical form, it doesn't matter. Nintendo is going to keep going back to the well and re-releasing all these back catalog of games because they make a lot of money doing it. The development's already done on most of those titles. So there's your answer. SM Pratt basically says coin collecting is outdated. Nobody uses coins. And they're pointless. Response, okay, this is the problem that I have. Let's analyze this from a standpoint. First, full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of SM Pratt. I'm a huge fan of Rudy with Alpha Investments. Ironically, if you go back and you listen to a lot of early Rudy videos, he does collect graded currency, which is a subcategory of coins, newsmismatics. So Rudy is involved in that market just like I am. That being said, I do want to respond to this. I have nothing but respect for SM Pratt, so I hope that nobody takes this comment the wrong way. The collectible coin marketplace in the antiques and collectibles trade has a market cap of $3.5 billion to $4 billion per year. Now, let me explain what that means to some of the non-finance people that are probably watching this video. What that means is when we exclude all collectible modern era products, so your American Silver Eagles, your American Gold Eagles, all the bullion products, which means the, gu the Buffalo Gold Coin, all the modern mint products that are being populated and sold by the U.S. Mint at present time, just collectible coins alone has a market cap of $3.5 to $4 billion per year. That means every calendar year, $3.5 billion to $4 billion worth of coins, collectible coins, most of this stuff graded by NGC, PCGS, is changing hands. It is one of the biggest markets in the entire antiques and collectibles trade. To sit here and say that coin collecting is outdated is exactly the point. The reason why it is collected and consumed so much and is seen as a massive alternate asset class from millionaires to billionaires alike is because it is an antiquated currency. That's the whole point. It's no different at some point in the future, Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, they're going to cease producing a cardboard card at some point. 
Now, ironically, this is what I would say to SM Pratt. And I already know the answer because I respect the guy. I really like the guy and his channel a lot. So I'm not trying to instigate anything with SM Pratt or any of the Pokemon people. But ironically, a piece of cardboard is also antiquated in today's digital age. So you could also argue, well, nobody uses coins. Well, ironically, look at Magic the Gathering Arena or Magic the Gathering Online. You don't need a piece of cardboard to play a lot of these games and a lot of these collecting categories. It's no different than video games. Video games are going all digital, guys, whether you realize it or not. So by using SM Pratt's logic here, if you're investing in great video games, if you're investing in Magic the Gathering or Pokemon, at some point you have to understand the goal from those manufacturers to cut costs is going to be to take all those platforms and put them digitally out there to the point where there is no physical product. When we get to that point, are we then going to be able to say, well, obviously Pokemon card, Magic the Gathering card, and video game collecting is outdated because the particular physical products are no longer being made. Yes, coins have changed. The way that we handle currency in our world economy, whether you're a developed nation or a developing nation, has changed substantially over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That being said, that's the whole point of coin collecting. That's why it's so iconic. It takes you back to another time frame. And again, to reiterate my main point with this question is, you must understand that there is no other antique and collecting category, with the exception of high-end art that sells for $100 million, $500 million per painting, that has a market cap of $3.5 to $4 billion per year. And if you look at the market cap, for vintage Pokemon cards, which is an unestablished market at present time, or even great at video games, or even Magic the Gathering cards, there isn't any of those markets that have a market cap of $3.5 to $4 billion when we're strictly looking at vintage collectible items in those categories. So be very careful how you analyze these markets. I, again, I respect SM Pratt greatly. I am a fan of his channel. I watch every single one of the videos that he produces. But on this... I do disagree because ironically, that's the whole point. That's what makes coins extremely appealing and extremely valuable, especially to collectors. Let me leave you with one final thought on this question because I think it's important. Today, one of the highest and most valuable prices paid for a collectible coin is $10 million. You let me know when Pokemon, Magic, or video games ever gets to the point where they have one key item selling for $10 million or more. It's going to be decades, guys, if you even get there at all. Comic books aren't even there yet, and comic books are an established collecting category. The most expensive comic book sold, I think, was either 4 or $5 million. We're not at the $10 million mark for comic books. Coins and currency are in a market by themselves. There is a reason why a lot of people like me and other antique experts always preach about learning that particular market and investing in it for the long term. More on that in upcoming videos. That was a great question. Thank you. I am glad that you brought that up. Q&A question. What is your opinion of the best collecting categories to start today in order of small budget, under $500, middle budget, $500 to $50,000, and big budget, $500,000 or more? Well, I can tell you in a budget between five and fifty thousand, I'm sorry, five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I would be going after coins, currency, first edition collectible books, historical documents, firearms, edge weapons, antiquities, traditional antiques. Um, ironically, you're probably not going to get in any of those categories for five hundred bucks. It's possible, but I wouldn't really count on it. Really, honestly, if you can spend more than fifteen hundred dollars per item that you're buying. You can really play in a lot of these markets. You can even get into artwork for that particular market price range. Now, when you talk about big budget, 500000 or more, I would be going after certain pieces of rare coins, currency, high-end artwork. If, I could have, if, if you can afford half a million dollars on one item, those are definitely markets that I would get involved in. Um, I would get into the antiquities market, but I'd be very cautious if I did so because, again, that market is pretty much a free-for-all. You have to be really careful what you're doing when you get into the market for items that are literally thousands, if not millions of years of age or older. Um, for $500 or less, I really hate to say this, you're pretty much stuck in a lot of the speculative markets. Whether we're looking at speculative comic books, video games, 
Pokemon cards, Magic the Gathering, vintage video games, all those markets are pretty much of a speculative nature, and they're the ones that cost the least to get into overall, with some exceptions, obviously, because the barrier to entry is quite low. That's why there's a lot of speculation in those markets. Anybody can get into those markets. Anybody who has a job, whether you work as a manager at McDonald's or whether you're CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you can collect graded or vintage video games. Not everything is that expensive in those markets. They're just very speculative. So I will expand on this in an upcoming video because I think it's a great question. I would, though, state that going from $500 to $50,000, that's a very broad range. How I would have worded this question is less than $500, $500 to $5,000, and then $5,000 to $50,000, $50,000 to half a million dollars. So when I tackle this question in an upcoming video, that's pretty much how I'll probably word it. But that video should give you insight on this in deeper depth if I didn't help already. Are you truly a collector if you are only collecting for investment, business endeavors, and other money-making schemes? Yes, because it all starts with passions, guys. Nobody sets out and says, you know what? I want to diversify assets. I'm going to go into the high-end art market. Or I'm going to go out and, and, and start buying up coins that I may not know anything about just because I want to diversify assets, or I hear people talk that they're good investments. You have to have a passion for this stuff. Unlike stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, silver, cryptocurrency, mutual funds, ETFs, most of those items can be done analytically where you don't have to have an emotional attachment to buying Bank of America stock or buying a Vanguard mutual fund. You don't have to love Vanguard to call them up and say, hey, I want to put $5,000 in a S&P 500 index fund. Let's be honest. When you get into the antique side of the equation, I often encourage people who are going to invest in these items to at least go after something that they have a passion for. And when you do the analysis of that collecting category, you may come back and you may go, well, gee, I'm really passionate about this one collecting category, but I don't think it's really an investable collecting category for the long term. Well, then what you have to do is you have to take a realistic approach and look at some of the other collecting categories that are out there that you do have a passion for if you want to go that route. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with collecting just because you have a passion for something. It's just if you're going to do that, don't then try to call it investment after the fact. The people that go into these markets and make a ton of money in the antiques and collectibles trade, they all have written business plans. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me in my antique and consulting business and they tell me, hey, I spent $50,000 on vintage video games. I'm in over my head. I need you to look through. How can I make money on this going forward? And the first thing that I tell them is, well, if you start out investing in anything, it starts with a written plan. It starts with an analysis of the market and a written plan. If you come to me for consulting advice in the antiques and collectibles trade, I will give you a written plan on some of these collecting categories. That's my promise to a lot of my clients. And my clients love that because nobody ever sat them down and said, hey, here's the risks if you're going after vintage video games. Or look, here's a list of the risks if you're going after coins or currency or vintage toys or vintage comic books. Here's the risks. Here's the reality of what you need to learn before you get into these markets. So you can have a passion for something. And as long as you don't let your emotions take hold, you can make money off of that particular item whether it's just in a passion or you want to make it into an investment. You just have to understand the risk versus reward ratio. Next question. What are your thoughts on price gouging on the market right now, like the Nintendo Switch and Ring Fit selling for twice its retail value? This is a great question. Just understand this is temporary, guys. Just because you can get $400, $500 for a Nintendo Switch due to everybody being stuck inside due to the quote-unquote virus, it does not mean that a Nintendo Switch is going to be worth four or $500 when this is over. And I would really tell the people that are willing to pay a premium for those items to use some sense of caution because we're also going to have historic numbers of unemployment when all this is over. So if you're one of the people that just lost your job and you're paying $500 for a $300 Nintendo Switch at present time, I really can't say that you're making the best use of your money at present time, even though you may be stuck in the house for the next 30, 60 days. Who knows? That being said, understand that this is just temporary. What are my thoughts on it? It's simple supply and demand. 
there's less supply of these products because obviously they can't come into the country or they're not being manufactured at present time due to what's going on in the world, people are willing to want to buy these items because they are stuck inside, so the price is going up. Supply, demand, that's the whole basis of this. Next question. I have an old metal antique folding telescope cup or what may be a spittoon. I'm not sure what it is. On the bottom, it has a trademark in the design of a World War II Iron Cross that has the word hero spelled in the cross. What do I have, Sean? The top side of the cross has the word patent. The bottom says pending. On the left side of the cross, it says trade, and the right side says mark. It looks silver metallic hockey puck with the lid on it, and it has the same circumference of a can of Copenhagen. I would have to see it to even give you my opinion. Um, the wording and the description, I don't know at this particular time. Um, honestly, I could make a guess. I don't want to do that without seeing a picture of it. If you can upload a picture, I will gladly attempt to look at it and tell you what I think it is. Um, what does bother me is the fact, though, that it does say patent and it has patent pending next to it. This tells me that this was made after the time of the Industrial Revolution. Same thing with the words trademark on it. Now, to be fair, that doesn't mean that it's going to be worth less completely, but that does mean it's not really possibly going to be a one-of-a-kind item. So I just want to get you to understand that in advance. If you do post a picture of this, though, I'll be happy to look at it. Again, usually when items have any type of patent date on them, it signifies that they were made, especially after the patent office was established, but also during the Industrial Revolution, which means overall you could still have a valuable item, but... When that type of stuff is seen and printed on an item, it tells me that it's fairly new, meaning within the last 100, 120 years. So I just want to put that out there before I would even try to appraise this. But to appraise it, I would need a picture. And one more question since we're nearing the 30-minute mark, and that's where I want to end this video, at least part one. What do you think about fossil collecting? Fossil collecting is very esoteric. There are a lot of auction houses that are catering to that market right now, mainly heritage auctions, along with minerals and rocks and other esoteric collecting categories of that type. It depends what type of fossils we're talking about. If we are talking about the high end of the market, meaning you have multimillionaires going after dinosaur fossils, that particular aspect of the trade is controversial to some because there's a lot of people that think those products or items, I should say, belong only in a museum, whereas others have no problem with private ownership of certain fossils. However, the market is very fragmented. There's a lot of people that are coming into that market with dollar signs in their head, not realizing that you really have to be able to sell that particular item to a very esoteric collector out there. It's not a mainstream collecting category. So I think it's a great, interesting hobby and market, but it's not for everybody. And there's a lot of risks in that market. On the other side of the proverbial coin, or I should say the other side of the bone, um, there's a lot of people that are also getting into that market who are at the low end side of the trade, where they're buying up fossils that are maybe $500 or less on average. That market is very speculative it's not really established, and ironically, those people are taking more of a risk than they need to when compared to other collecting categories. So I hope that answered your question. That's the end of part one. I will upload part two in several days from now. I hope that you've gotten something out of this video. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.